Hello, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener, the show where we answer questions about gardening and plants and insects and anything you can think of we're going to talk about today. I'm Shane Cultra. I'll be your host today. I'm t uh, filling in for Diane Nolan. She does get a couple days off during the year, and today is going to be one of them. But as always, she left me in good hands with some great people to answer your questions. And I'm going to start off the show by introducing them today, and we're going to let Rusty introduce himself. All right, thank you, Shane. Um, my name is Rusty Malding. I am the owner and partner for Nature's View. Um, it's a landscape business up out of Watsika. I own it with my wife, Corey. Um, I also am the president of the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you first about, um, there's going to be a, a picture come up here on your screen about uh, you that got a little bit too much water. So if you remember back in June and July when we had lots of water, in our area we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 28 inches of rain over the course of about seven weeks um, and then proceeded to get very dry. Well, uh, when I hear about two weeks ago, I noticed that many of the ewes around town were developing this sort of discoloration. Um, it turns out they're dying. Uh, what happened was, uh, by the extra rainfall, uh, the roots were saturated, and it, it was an environmental stress that allowed uh, either Phytophthora or Pythium to come in and uh, it attacked those roots. Then things got very dry, and so the, the viable roots that were still there were, weren't enough to sustain the plant whenever it got dry. And the discoloration, that reddish color, is a very sort of telltale sign that it was uh, waterlogged. Um, now this was an unusual situation, so I, I'm not suggesting go out and replant you know, a different species, but uh, if you, especially if you have this in sort of a row like these were. Um, but in general, if you start seeing this, uh, consider whether or not you have uh, maybe some extra water coming from a downspout in the, in the area nearby. Um, maybe it is purely environmental and we've had a, just a tremendous amount of rainfall. And there are, are many other species of plants um, like Itea or Sweet Spire uh, that would do well in sort of a, a, a boggy or, or more water laden soil. Yeah, and that's, that's something to remember that, you know, I, I almost feel embarrassed as all these different things I keep saying are once in a lifetime things. <laughs> know, right? And there's been three different once in a, you know, t you said 28 inches of rain. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, that, that was probably underwater. So, yeah, that's, it's getting hard to tell people don't abandon something because it didn't live. It was 28 inches of rain, and that's probably not going to happen. Yeah, we, Hopefully we hope, not in our lifetime. We so, hope not again. Yeah, soon. That's, a, that's a good lesson there. Well, uh, that's a good answer. And that, again, it shows things happen much later after the actual event that comes around, and it's, it takes months and months to, to react to that. So, Kay, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, okay. and you have a question for us as well. Thank you. I'm Kay Carnes. I'm a Champaign County Master Gardener. And my areas of expertise are uh, vegetables, herbs, uh, seed saving, and uh, some flowers. <clears throat> and today I brought you a head of garlic. And I'm going to talk a little bit about planting garlic because that time is coming up. I usually plant mine about the 1st of um, October. So this whole thing is called the head of the garlic. And what you're going to plant are these individual cloves. So this, this you would take off, you know, this is what you would cook with. Um, you want to remember that the larger the clove, the larger the head of garlic you're going to get. Um, I put mine in raised beds and I like to dig them up and add a little compost every year to them. Uh, you want to plant these cloves with the pointed side up and you're going to plant them about three or four inches deep and about six inches apart and the rows should be about um, six or to eight inches apart. Um, <clears throat> after you plant them, you want to cover them well with um, a nice mulch. I prefer straw. Um, I tried grass clippings last year, and with the dampness and wetness that we had this year, they, it was a little too thick and heavy, and it, um, we got kind of waterlogged. So straw is a little bit better, but you want a nice thick layer of it. And then all you do is leave it and uh, until July, and then you, when the leaves start drying, is when you harvest. Yeah. So. so plant now for next plant year's now. plants. And um, you can get garlic a lot of different places. I get mine. I usually plant about ten different varieties. Uh, not all garlic is the same, and uh, you can get it online, or you can go to the farmers market and just buy a head from one of the local farmers. All right. Well, last but not least, the ever-famous Dr. Jim Appleby. You'd like to introduce yourself and 
And I'm Jim Appleby, and I'm in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences, and uh, I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. And, um, you know, uh, Shane, we've heard a lot about natural insect control. I think that's very popular these days. Yeah. And uh, I actually wrote up an article here as Birds for Natural Insect Control, and you see that phone number there on the screen that uh, you can get this um, publication I made up, and if you just call that number, they will send you this publication. And, uh, you know, I think at this time of year, a lot of us start thinking about, um, about uh, feeding birds. The problem when you feed birds is that you have the problem with raccoons and squirrels and sometimes possums. And uh, those animals, particularly raccoons, can just absolutely destroy a bird feeder, as well as do squirrels. One method I found out was to use this uh, PVC pipe. So if you use a PVC pipe, and it's, I tell, I tell you all about this in this uh, paper I, I wrote up, to, to use a PVC pipe and then attach your uh, feeders on the PVC pipe, and it works out real well. Those animals can't climb a PVC pipe. It's just too slippery. And uh, it really works out well. I have no more problems now with squirrels or raccoons. And so if you're feeding birds, uh, I think you'd uh, really like using that, that method, using a PVC pipe, and it tells you how to do it. So you're saying I don't have to spend $122 for the squirrelinator and <laughs> keep the squirrels <laughs> off of just a plain old PVC pipe? We'll do the trick? You know, one time I did have a squirrel that was real smart, and he actually was able to get up the pipe. What, what he did was he ran way, way out and then ran as fast as he could, and he had enough momentum that he could he got, got up above some. it. But I fixed it because I sprayed the pipe with uh, silicone spray. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so it. frustrated. So you are officially smarter than a squirrel. Uh, he was really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, before we get to the phone calls, and you can call in and, and ask, ask a, a question today, we're going to go ahead and go to Did You Know segment. A native plant of China, rhubarb was grown and traded for medicinal purposes as early as the 16th century. Rhubarb gained popularity as a food and vegetable source by the 19th century. All right, we're going to start going to the phone lines now. Again, you can call in if you'd like to ask a, this panel a question. We're going to start with line three, Janet. She has a question about a cherry tree. I actually have two cherry trees, and um, they were full of leaves. They had lots of leaves on them this, this summer, early this summer, and we had lots of cherries. But then um, about July, it started seeing yellow on the tree, and then all the leaves fell off. And now some leaves are starting to come back on, but they're real sparse. Am I going to lose the trees, or are they just junk, or do I need to do something to them? More, more than likely, it's a, it's a foliar disease. Uh, if you said they started to yellow, you probably saw some spots on them as well. Cherry trees aren't typically real bad about this. Usually you see it more with some of the apple trees. Uh, but uh, more than likely with the excessive amounts of rain we already talked about that you sort of had in, in June and probably very early July, uh, some high humidity and you've got some uh, uh, some fungal growth going on your leaves and the tree shed them and it, I'm actually somewhat surprised that it's, it's leafing back out to be quite frank. Um, if that's the case, uh, you should have no problem with it leafing back out next year. Yeah, that's, it's, I bet you I had a thousand people <coughs> over the course of the last three weeks ask the exact same question. It was fruiting trees, crab apples were terrible this year about yeah. losing leaves more than ever, even prairie fire, which usually isn't too bad, and then ivory silk lilacs were exceptionally bad. So mm -hmm. uh, the good news is the leaves are done, their job is done, losing a leaf isn't that big a deal, but you're not the only one. It is, God, yeah. every day the phones, you know, this, it, this show epidemic. times eight hours a day. <laughs> so I think you're going to be fine. You can always do a scratch test. I always tell people, uh, take your fingernail and scratch that limb. And if you have a nice bright green color under it, then you still have a healthy tree. It's just dropped its leaves because it just doesn't feel that it can contain or sustain those leaves at that time. So I, I think you'll be fine. You know, there are cases where they, you do lose them, but more often than not this year, I think you'll be okay. All right, we're going to go to another uh, phone call. We're going to go to line four, Sandra, Red Twig Dogwood. Right, Red Twig Dogwood. I have a foliage problem, too. I called about six weeks ago, maybe, and said that all the foliage was gone on my Red Twig Dogwood, <laughs> but with no foliage left on the ground. 
and nobody had an answer. Well, then I got excited a couple years, a couple uh, weeks later. It grew all the leaves back on again. And then I checked it out today, and all the leaves are gone again. Again, no foliage on the ground, and there may be just a leaf or two there with you can see a couple bites out of it. What would be defoliating? What animal <laughs> would well, be defoliating? I think what you have is the dogwood sawfly. So what I would suggest you do is to very carefully examine that tree at weekly intervals, that bush. Uh, those uh, sawfly larvae develop very, very rapidly, and uh, they're sort of whitish in color. They, they looked almost as if they were dipped maybe in uh, um, powdery, uh, what do you call it, like powder, uh, like just powder like sugar. sugar. Yeah, powder like sugar. Powder, right, that, like that. That's what they look like, they're sort of whitish. But um, they can cause a lot of damage, complete defoliation of a red twig dogwood. I have a feeling that's what you have. And you know, you can get rid of that with uh, insecticide like malathion is common or seven or anything like that when you see them. But look at the plants about uh, at weekly intervals because uh, uh, they develop in a matter of just a couple of weeks. Thank you. Yeah. To, to do it twice, too. They were probably just as excited as she was when the leaves came back. <laughs> so. More so, that was dinner. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, don't get too excited, Jim, but the next phone call on line five has a question or a, a recipe about homemade insecticidal soap, which is not going to be good in the bathtub. But <laughs> Line five? Hi. Uh, I have had a horrible infestation of white flies this summer, and Insecticide soap is so expensive to buy. I wondered if there was a really good recipe that I could make at home that would be a lot cheaper. Uh, not that I know of. I, I really think that it would be a, a good idea to uh, simply uh, to uh, purchase. I mean, you know, it's not that expensive, and um, use a commercial. You have to repeat that application though about once every week uh, because the soap does not kill the. Uh, the larger larvae of that uh, insect. Uh, it kills the very young ones, the ones that just newly hatched, and it probably wouldn't control the egg stage either. So you have to repeat that application over and over again about once every week. Yeah, in insecticidal soap, is it, it works, but it's not as strong as a lot of people think it is. Right. And it, you know, a bottle is under $10. You know, it, what's expensive to one person is not to another is, yeah. is different. But you know, under $10, you can get a decent bottle yeah. of it. I, I would be really cautious about using, com you know, the commercial soaps. Yeah. Because you can get some burning with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and go to another round of questions and answers. And uh, we're going to answer a second question t today. All right. Yeah. Uh, we have a viewer that wrote in with an email about peach trees. Um, they've got uh, four or five peach trees that were planted f about five years ago. And they're noticing a lot of root suckers that are coming up and starting to dig them up and trying to graft them. And it didn't work. Um, and so the question is, um, can these sprouts be cultivated? So just a little bit about fruit trees in general. Uh, typically, they're, they're a grafted. Um, plant and you've got a rootstock and then a scion or the top part and they're, they're, they're grafted together so that one is kind of plugged into the other. So the roots that are coming up are very, very different likely than what the, the, the current peach uh, producing plant is on top. Um, so it, it might work but you may wind up with something that's completely different um, from, a, from a tree. Uh, best example I can give you is most people have seen a, a rose that looks like it has died back to the ground and then they see a little ray of hope because along about June 1st this little sprig comes up out of the ground and by July 14th or 15th they're wondering what happened to my rose because it's flowering a different color it's three times the size as the old one it's the exact same thing you've got a rootstock that's coming back and it's not the top portion so um, you, you can try it but um, I, I'd, I'd suggest keeping on with what you have and uh, leaving it there. <laughs> yeah, if the, the good plants at the top and the good roots are at the bottom and if you flip them that's if it was a great plant it'd be on top. Yeah. So exactly. That's, that's exactly. exactly how we usually look at it. All right, we're going to we're going to actually go back to the phones because we have some more phone calls today and we're going to go to line 6. Jane has a question about trimming Josie lilacs. Yes, they they're real tall. They're taller than the deck and it's fairly close to the deck and I'd like to trim it but I don't know if it can be trimmed this time of year. 
generally speaking, um, I prefer not to trim uh, from sort of the f September 1st through October 15th or so. Uh, every time you trim, you're encouraging new growth. And if you encourage new growth at this time of year, you may not, uh, it may not have a chance to harden off before the first frost or first freeze. Um, the other challenge that you're going to have with a lilac in particular, spring flowering shrub, uh, and it, if you trim it now or in the dormant season, you're going to lose that floral display next spring. Um, that being said, if it's way out of control and too much, much too large, uh, dormant pruning is an ideal time to knock those back in size, and you can, you can really give lilacs a whack and, and they will come back. Uh, you are going to forego the, the flowering for the next year, but if you can get it under control, that might be a, a, a good way to go. Yeah, the, the, the best on lilacs is to bloom them, or to trim them right after they bloom. So as soon as the blooms are spent, go ahead and take it back almost as hard as you want, and you're really not going to hurt the tree at all. So that's always the best time. So if you can get all the way through to next April, May, June, yeah. go ahead and wait till then, enjoy the flowers, and then whack away, yep. and you'll be fine. All right, we're going to go back to you, Kay. We, we wanted to get that phone call in, and we're going to go ahead and let you do a little question. Okay, I have an a email from a listener, and they say, because squirrels like to take tomatoes from my plants, I have devised a frame and wire mesh structure to protect the tomatoes. I have enjoyed good yield for a few years, but there is a problem. The plants grow through the mesh at the top of the structure, continuing to produce tomatoes unprotected. If I pinched off the tops of the plants, do you think they would get bushier instead of taller? Any suggestions? Well, they may, <coughs> um, but you're still going to have the problem of them um, growing up through. I noticed from your picture that um, your mesh is low, and so you might try making more of a cage type of, of structure. Um, another thing you could do is um, try to grow determinate tomatoes. There's two types of tomatoes. Um, there's in, indeterminate and determinate. And indeterminate uh, produce tomatoes throughout the season and they keep growing and growing and growing and get very tall. <coughs> uh, determinate to tomatoes are um, bushier, smaller and bushier, and um, they the drawback would be they only, usually only produce tomatoes kind of in it all at one time, although I've had some um, continue. So you might try that. Um, you might try some kind of repellent. <clears throat> There's certainly a number of them out there um, for uh, animal repellents. Um, I, I've actually, f I feed the squirrels um, <laughs> corn and, and <laughs> we have black walnut trees and so that kind of, they never bother my tomatoes. Um, so that's a, a few options um, that you could try. Yeah, and we there's a product called Plant Skid that's a natural, and it seems to be one of the few that works on squirrels. And I say that because people come in having said it was successful yeah. to the point where we actually had to carry it because yeah. it was working for squirrels. Everything else it doesn't seem to yeah, work. Squir but, but squirrels but are difficult. Yeah, they're a little. Yeah, they're a lot mm -hmm. more difficult than rabbits mm -hmm. and deer. So mm -hmm. that's something to think about. Bigger cage seems to be yeah, the first the thing taller, I'd say. It was a tiny uh -huh. cage. So. All right, Jim, we're going to go ahead and answer one more email question you had as well yes, on the uh, fake we, bees. We had a, uh, an email from uh, Min Minnie from Bolingbrook, uh, Illinois, and uh, she said that uh, she got stung by bees, and uh, she, the uh, indication was, boy, can they sting and be mean. Uh, actually, uh, what you have, Minnie, is, a, uh, is not bees. It's the uh, bald-faced hornet. And you see the big nest there in her tree, and uh, you know when we talk about natural insect control, hornets and uh, wasps are really important in controlling a lot of the different um, insects, particularly larvae that attack our um, vegetables. So, if if possible, I wouldn't do anything about it. Just let them go and and not not bother them. Uh, if you do have to control them, I would. They have some of these. Um, wasp sprays that you can buy commercially and you want to apply that at, at night after dark and have somebody else shine a light on the nest and then squirt that material up into the hole where they're going in and out. Um, personally I wouldn't do that. Uh, I would let them go and uh, as soon as we get some uh, freezing temperatures though all of them will die except the queens. Uh, only the queens will overwinter. So if you actually want to use that nest wait until we get temperatures probably in the, the mid-20s, 
and you can take that, clip that nest off the uh, branch, and you know, bring it in and, as a conversation piece. But <laughs> it's the bald-faced hornet that's causing the problem. Yeah, a true story. We did that as kids, and there was other stuff. It took a couple of weeks, but the, something hatched, and we had some bugs inside. So maybe we took it at the wrong time. I think you took yeah, it. Yeah, well, it was in North Carolina, a little different temperatures oh, yeah. there. So <laughs> I'd be careful when you take it in. It is a conversation piece when you stung, get stung. So. All right, we're going to go back to the phone lines, and we're going to go to line four. Jerry's got a question about tree spade trees. Yes, I'm interested in installing a couple of large trees that would be installed with a tree spade, and I'm wondering what time of year is best. Uh, you know, I, I guess it uh, probably depends somewhat on the species. Uh, fall is really a great time to, uh, to plant trees in general. Uh, I've been talking with nurseries here just in the last uh, couple of days, and what I, the information I'm getting is they're going to start digging trees again here in about the next two weeks, or thereabouts, when the, when the temperatures and conditions are right for it. Um, so really, after the nursery start digging, you're, you're good to go uh, for most species. Now there are some things that are a spring dig, and you know, if you're moving with the tree spade, I'm assuming you're also digging it with the tree spade. Um, uh, so really consult, I guess, whoever you're going to have run the tree spade, and they should be familiar enough with, with the different species uh, that you would want to avoid. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that. We do tree spade. Well, I shouldn't, we don't do any movement from our nursery, but we do have people come in and, uh, yeah, as soon as it rains and as soon as it cools off, which probably is next week, we're going to start digging. And when it comes to the fall dig, everybody, you'll ask seven different nurserymen and they're going to have seven different answers about what to dig and what not to dig. But uh, if you have a large spade, like we have 90 inch tree spades come in, we've had pretty good luck with almost everything. But smaller than that, there are certain trees that we avoid and, and you know, it depends on the winter. But it, the time's coming up now and then of course March. March is the mm -hmm. other time. Is time. Uh, and it just comes down to can you get a tree spade into the fields and out of the fields and into your yard and out of the yard. Mother Nature mm -hmm. and wetness plays a big part of that. So tree spade trees are nice and they're instant. So mm -hmm. uh, good time to do that. All right, we're going to go to another phone call or line six. Jim has an oak leaf hydrangea question. Yes, I have a uh, oak leaf hydrangea. It's gotten rather leggy looking. Uh, it's on the south side. It's underneath a shagboy kickery tree. And I just don't know when to trim it or how to make it produce flowers. <laughs> okay. I, go ahead I, I don't want to monopolize here. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's okay. Jump in. <laughs> um, answer, you can answer uh, the question. Okay, let's, let's, let's roll with it. Um, uh, oak leaf hydrangea flowers on old wood. Um, some of the hydrangeas, some of the other summer flowering hydrangeas flower on new wood. Uh, because it flowers on old wood, you want to trim it back after it's flowered, uh, and those usually flower in about uh, know, third week of June, first part of July. Uh, so sometime in really early August is probably a good time to just sort of give it a good haircut. Um, depending on, if you're in a lot of shade, you may have some issues just getting that full development at the bottom. Um, but typically, oak leaf hydrangea does pretty well in, in pretty moderate shade. So uh, maybe just cut it back a little bit. Uh, we were talking earlier with rabbits. Uh, that's, a, that's a rabbit favorite. <laughs> they may help you along the process if you have some neighbors that uh, have some conducive nesting sites. But um, in general, just getting a good, good haircut and it should, uh, should flush back and be l lower limbed. Yeah. And, we, and in containers, when we grow them, we actually we do some winter pruning. Again, you have to be careful with the rabbits. You don't want to cut it down in half and let them finish it off. But we do trim them back pretty hard uh, and, and form a small little mound that flushes out quite nicely if it gets too leggy. And they do get leggy very easily. They can, you can get three branches that are three and four feet tall. So we take them back and let some new growth from the bottom. So yeah, trimming them back hard. It's a little scary because they've got so much plant to yeah. bring them back, but it does work on oak leaves especially. Yeah, the rejuvenation where you yeah, come back to like literally like four inches. Yeah, it starts them all over and does a pretty good job. All right, we're going to try and sneak in one more question. Uh, line five has been patient. Uh, tree growing condition question. Yes, can banana trees be grown in the Danville area, uh, outside and left outside? Banana. Well, yeah. I, I can take that one too. There's <laughs> lots of people that say that they've had luck planting a banana and mulching it in uh, and having it come back. In general, I'm going to say no because most of the ones that we have do not come back. But 
every year I have the person that comes in, gives me a tree, a banana tree that says, this has come back every year. Every year I planted at my house and it has not come back for, for <laughs> me. So I don't know if I'm, you know, I don't know if I'm not meant to grow those or, uh, uh, but they, they do say some zone six bananas. They, there are people that there are such things. You're not going to get fruit. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to have a tropical party at your house with banana trees. But um, there are some that are a little hardier than others. Plant it next to your dryer vent and you will have much better luck. I've had good luck growing plants that are not meant to by putting it by the dryer vent all winter mm -hmm. and that keeps it just enough. So you can over overwinter rosemary. Yeah, that that's too. the dryer vent's a nice little microclimate. So. Uh, that's something to think about, hardy bananas in Illinois. Maybe that'll be the next popular plant. Well, thank you for all your calls today. And remember, we'll be back next week and we'll see you then.